Good afternoon and welcome to this year's edition of Ask the JDK Architects at DevOx Belgium. Uh, I'm Mark Reinhold, listed on the bottom. Why don't we introduce ourselves, starting with Alan, who re steadfastly refuses to publish his Twitter handle, but he does have one. Alan Bateman, working on the JDK, a module system for JDK 9. I'm a doctor, not an architect, damn it. <laughs> Uh, my, name, my name is Stuart Marks. Um, I'm also known as Dr. Deprecator. I work on the JDK Core Libraries group, including on collections, Lambda, streams, and deprecation. Oh, oh you have your. Oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm already hooked up. I'm Brian Getz, uh, Java Language Architect. Okay, so this is a question and answer session. Um, and I have here on my laptop the shortest possible Oracle slide deck. Can you guess what the other important slide is? <laughs> That's right. Do not believe a word we say. Okay, so this is Q&A. If you're in the room and you're not shy, there's a microphone up there. Please walk over to the microphone. Don't shout, because if you shout, well, we'll ask you to go to the microphone. Because if you don't go to the microphone, then we will have to repeat your question and we will probably get it wrong. We might intentionally get it wrong even, who knows? That's the most fun part. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't want to answer that anyway, question. I'll give me the Well, whatever. So the microphone is there. Please use it. Uh, if you're shy, you can tweet to the Ask Arch, Ask Arch hashtag. And I'll be looking for that on Twitter. So if you're shy or if you're not in the room but you just want to ask a question and you happen to know this is going on, even though it's not live streamed, you could do it that way. So we have 57 minutes left. Any questions or are we done? Really, we, okay. we didn't we'll, we'll stay long enough for the pictures yeah. and then we'll yeah. wrap up, I guess. So. Do, we, do we have any primer questions? Do we have any primer questions? Well, no. Did, did we make Why aren't there versions in the model system? Ah, <laughs> ah here we go. Our first customer. Please. Um, I think there's a, there was a mistake done in Java, I, I, I think, Four or something, no. and the assert statement no. was introduced. It was disabled by default. This led to uh, even the unit having a search true method, which would be unnecessary if it would have been enabled by default. Sorry, uh, you're talking about the assert keyword? Yeah, yeah. Nobody uses it because it's disabled by default. I think um, yeah. in Java E8, uh, Java SE8, uh, there was a similar issue um, because uh, the parameters um, um, names are not built in by default. So you have to enable them, which leads to that the Java EE specs have to discuss if they can use this meta information or not. Mm -hmm. Bummer. <laughs> Do you think it would be possible to not listen to the people working on uh, Java card or things like that are, that are really essentially uh, uh, trying to optimize the last bit and listen more to the people that have huge amounts of memory and don't care if a class is um, 20 bytes longer. So, so the people who work on smaller things and not, not, not just as small as Java card, but anybody who works on memory constrained uh, systems asks us the same question of you. Could you please stop listening to the enterprise guys and bloating up the class file with all sorts of stuff that they might need once in a blue moon? So, I mean, given that we're in a position where we have to make a choice that's a one size fits all decision, we try to do the least harm. Um, and, you know, I, I, you, so you're right in a sense that it is useless in the sense that you can't count on it, but that sort of assumes that it should always be available. And in fact, it's not always available. It's not gonna be available on old class files either. The ecosystem hasn't been purged of old class files. So given that applications need to deal with the fact that the parameter names aren't there, it didn't seem an unreasonable default, and it seemed a reasonable balancing of the needs of the various constituencies in the ecosystem. And you know, 
this brings up a, very, a general question for us, which, which is everybody sort of assumes that their problem is representative of the whole ecosystem. And because Java is actually successful, there is a significant plurality of, of, of uh, you know, constituents who are in different little corners of the ecosystem, and they have radically different needs. And, and it's a very difficult balancing act for us to try to make them all happy. So, you know, we're s sorry we made you unhappy, <laughs> but it was a choice between making you unhappy or making somebody equally worthy and vocal unhappy. I'm not and, saying that they are less uh, worthy listening yeah. to, but I think they also already um, invest quite a lot of work into optimizing, and they wouldn't bother uh, to add another flag to optimize even more. Still, the, um, the answer is no, it won't be changed. <laughs> <laughs> Would be incompatible. Actually, I have two more questions. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah. Actually, I, I'm, I'm actually curious of, uh, as to when it, does anyone here actually want to comment on trying to use the assert keyword for testing, whereas uh, so you said no one ever ever uses assert. I actually use the uh, the assert keyword quite a bit because it's actually very very useful for actually de for, for for debugging. But it's something that uh, that is very much a fatal error if this if this assertion triggers in, in the JDK when I'm running with the dash e ESA or whatever the yeah, the command line option is. That means that the system is actually going to blow up. The VM is actually going to shut down. That's very very different to an assertion that would put into a a, a unit test which I think is what you started off with, was trying to use the assert keyword in testing, and people end up then writing their own uh, t assert libraries, uh, li as in JUnit. Uh, but JUnit uses the assert error, if I remember correctly. Oh, are you talking about the, the assertion error, the exception class? Yes, I think. Hmm. Is there a assert exception? Or is there it's an assertion, it's an assertion error. It's, it's an assertion error. error. Yeah. Yeah. And the, but that was introduced specifically for the, for the implementation yeah. of the yeah. assert yeah. keyword. Yeah. Um, if JUnit chose to use that, that's that might not have been the best choice for JUnit to make. And they should use something else. I don't know. But I think they at least handle it correctly. Well, in, that's good. In their unit, in their yeah. case. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So I have do you have a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so a couple comments on the on both the assertion facility and the parameter parameter names. So on assertions, yes, I, I, I share the disappointment that the assert facility is not used more than it is, but it does find some use in libraries. As Alan mentioned, we do enable assertions in our test runs, and uh, they do occasionally find things. So that's so that's useful, but it's not as useful as one might think it would be. Um, but, but also to your point about uh, the, smaller, the smaller versions of Java, like micro edition and so forth, it's not just that. In fact, I, th I think the fact is that every implementation, even of Java SE and on the server side, is CPU constrained and memory constrained. And so every production, uh, not every, but I th I'm sure that there are many production uh, installations out there of even very, very large systems will want to disable assertions because they do not want to have those go going on in production. Um, so it's not just don't listen to the small guys. I think there's there's a, a, a wide-ranging set of concerns about running with assertions enabled or even having them on by default. Um, there are some really irritating side effects of assertions as well, which is that they increase the bytecode size of methods. And then I've, I've been, there's, there's resistance to adding assertions to methods, which is, oh, that blows the, the hotspot inlining limit, so don't do that, or put it in a comment instead, which is, Right, and so that's a you know that's a, that, that's one of these leaky abstraction things, right? <laughs> what do we do about that? I don't know, right? So so yes, it's a problem. There are various things we can do about it, but you know, it's I think it's unfortunately lower priority than some of the other things we're working on. Um, to this, 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 the same is true with the parameter names, right? It's not just a matter of that the jar file is bigger; it's that uh, it takes longer to parse, uh, you know, and load the class which is a startup uh, hazard, and it's more memory that gets kept around in, ca in case reflection uh, is asked to serve that information up. And so that's something that exacts uh, a time and space tax on everybody, which, uh, you know, again, is charging everybody for something that benefits a smaller, a smaller group. I can understand everything yeah. of, of what you say, but still I have never seen any, anybody disabling the debug information, for example. Uh, everybody leaves them in because they are the default. And 
uh, of course, if I am um, in stress, I have to optimize, then I would uh, disable these things, but I have never seen it happen in practice, in my perspective. Maybe other people no, we, have we, seen No, we've that. certainly seen yeah. people do this. Yeah, we, I hope we so. see everything. <laughs> yeah. uh, and by the way, once people start using JLink, the, the linker that we have in JDK9, you will actually see a lot of stripping of debugging because what we, people will be wanting to do is, is disturb it a small runtime. And in order to get it to as small as possible, they're going to be using the JLink options, which will which actually um, strip, yeah. strip in and, and, and compress to get everything as small as possible. Thank you. So, Thanks. One additional comment on parameter names. <laughs> so, so I think what it also potentially does is increases the API surface area. I was going to make okay. that point. Yeah, it's good, right? Because it's it's more things that are specified and cannot change. Or we could have blanket disclaimer. Don't depend on those names, but those those disclaimers never work because if we changed a method name, somebody's code would break and they would file a bug and we would have an argument about whether that dependency was proper, etc. So it's just more yeah. compatibility issues potentially to deal with. So that, that was... Well, and and compatibil yeah. compatibility issues that you might not even think about today, but you'll wind up facing in two years when a u user or a customer depended on a parameter name that you thought wasn't important but was recorded and then you changed it and now their code is broken and they're pissed off. This kind of thing, you know, this is like the, the, the story of Java for 20 years. Um, so uh, recording parameter names all the time by default, I think, you know, for, for Java, the language as it stands would probably be the wrong thing. People aren't used to thinking about it as part of the API compatibility surface area. Sorry. Uh, we saw today we saw today some code samples using a var keyword, which might at some point make it into Java. And certain JVM languages have had this for some time. So are there plans for a val keyword to encourage more immutability? And uh, in general, what are uh, what features from those different JVM languages are you considering to uh, add to plain old Java also? So shameless plug, you should come to the talk on Friday morning called uh, Java Future Sneak Peek in which more of this will be revealed. Uh, but to answer your question about VAR... But without any release commitments. <laughs> but without any release commitments. Uh, but to answer your question about VAR and Val, uh, it, it's, it's subtler than it looks um, because of a syntax decision that was made 20 years ago before we knew any better. So in Java, you say uh, type name and then variable name to declare uh, a, a variable. In um, some other languages, you say variable name colon type name. And you, you might think this is a trivial difference, but it actually makes quite a big difference. Um, and so if you declare your, um, declare your variables and types the other way, then the choice of whether to use inference or not and the choice of mutability or not become orthogonal choices. Um, and the, uh, if you had keywords for var and val like they have in Scala or in Kotlin, um, then you can also use those for declaring not only local variables but fields. Uh, we don't have that, unfortunately. We, arguably, it was a mistake we made 20 years ago. Um, it means that uh, having the val keyword is less useful uh, than it would be in a language where it was used to, uh, just, uh, to, to connote mutability uh, for, for all variables. Having a keyword that only connotes mutability for local variables is, makes it a weaker thing and therefore makes it less, um, less useful in the, con you know, in the context of Java that made this decision 20 years ago. This is all sort of unfortunate you know, uh, accidents of history, but it's a good example of how concepts that look like they should transplant perfectly from one language to another, right? We have local variables, they have local variables, they have var val, we could have var val, uh, but uh, there are often subtle considerations that mean transplanting the features, you don't actually end up with the same feature that you had in the other language. Uh, so it's not something we've made a decision on, but it's also something that's not the no-brainer that it looks like when you think about it for the first 30 seconds and say, oh, well, of course you would want to have val too. Uh, so we're still thinking about that. And what about data classes? Uh, what about data classes? Uh, Were you at the keynote this morning? Bad? Yeah. Come, so, come to Brian's talk on Friday. Yeah. Uh, so we showed an example of something like data classes uh, in the keynote in the keynote this morning, um, and uh, you know, 
again, if you look at la languages that have constructs like data classes, including Scala, including Kotlin, including C Sharp, they all have slightly different interpretations of what data classes mean, what members you get uh, generated by default, uh, whether they're designed for extensibility, whether they're designed for mutability, et cetera. Um, it, th these other languages are actually all over the map on this particular concept, and we haven't figured out exactly what the right semantics would be for Java, but it's something that we're, that we're working on as, as we you know, discussed uh, this morning. Thank you. Let's see if we do a question from Twitter. Um, uh, many of these look like they're... Uh, is that me? No, I think that was the mic up there. Oh, okay. Weird. Okay. Um, are up Brian's alley, um, uh, uh, along similar lines, what about pattern matching? What is the mystery about underscore? <laughs> <laughs> That's two questions. So, Take your pick. Um, well, I want to answer both of them. Go I love it. pattern matching. Uh, pattern matching is a very natural fit for languages like Java. Uh, and, and so it's something that we would like to do, and actually we'll be talking about it a little bit on Friday. Uh, one, one of the, you know, the, 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 the two features that people ask us for most often for, uh, for people who are coming you know, from Scala are local variable type inference and case classes. And case classes are essentially, um, essentially pattern matching. Uh, you, know, you define a, t a case class, you get some of the benefits of a data class, and you get an automatic pattern extractor out of it. Um, and that's something that, unlike a lot of other features, actually translates into Java fairly cleanly. And so it's definitely something we would like to do. The, uh, the mystery of the underscore is, is an interesting one uh, because we see all of, these, all of these tweets from people who see that underscore isn't a valid variable name, kind of wonder what on earth were those guys thinking, and point out to us how useful it would be to be able to use underscore as a variable name. We know. Mm -hmm. That's why we're in the situation we're in. So let's roll back. It used to be that underscore was a valid identifier. Uh, a lot of other languages use underscore much more profitably to represent a placeholder, either a variable that is not going to be used or um, you know, a, a, a label in a pattern match that's not going to be bound or a type that should be inferred, et cetera. So you, having it as an as a, as a identifier is really kind of a, a waste of a good, uh, of a good token. Um, we didn't like the idea of allowing underscore as a lambda parameter because a uh, lambda parameter name because it doesn't scale. We, we, well, we didn't like the Scala wonder bar approach. We definitely didn't want that. And then using it as a parameter name doesn't scale to more than one um, more than one argument. And it's a like I said, a waste of a pretty good syntactic token. But we can't make these changes all at once. So what we had to do was first warn about it and say, yeah, you've got some old code that uses this, so you should change it because it's not going to be supported. Then in 9, we were actually able to make an error to use underscore as an identifier, which is what makes people freak out because they think it, uh, because they think they want to use it as an underscore, as, as an identifier, when they really want to use it as a, um, as a not used indicator. Now we are finally free to give it the meaning we want to, but it takes three versions because we can't just pull the rug out from people uh, you know, so quickly. So yes, we know exactly what you want to do with it. That's the plan. That's why you can't do what you want to do with it now because it enables us to get to the point where it is a more sensible language feature in the future. Often doing the right thing takes long-term planning. You might notice Corbett is in its own module. <laughs> the reason for that. <laughs> Next question. Hi, I'm Matteo. First of all, uh, just a general thank you for the Java platform and the OpenJDK, because as a Java developer, when I'm happy, I also think it's uh, thanks to that. And uh, here's my question. So I found that uh, first time ever, I think, in my, uh, doing Java development, I found that, that uh, one of the JDK class behaves in a strange way, or at least to me, strange way, under certain condition. With OpenJDK now, I'm totally sure that I'm not like a drunk or anything, and I can see where the piece of the code that, that I think I have some doubts about it. What is not clear to me yet is where I'm supposed to ask this kind of doubt question and where I can, you know, uh, ask, not really raise it as a bug, but say, hey, why is the behavior like this? Oh, well, where, where's the code? 
I find it on uh, one of the sun dot uh, class. Not sun miscan safe, eh? but, uh, <laughs> Every, Everybody knows about that. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, one of the sun uh, www. I forgot the full package name. Failure connection, and I think uh, maybe. So it's so, so it's it's part of the networking uh, yeah. library. Yeah. Uh, Net dash dev at openjdk .java .net. or you could try asking it right now, and maybe we know the answer. Yeah, actually, I would need the, the code to pinpoint. So, but oh, basically, so, okay. the mailing list that I find uh, basically related to the OpenJDK are the correct yeah. place to ask this kind yeah, of Yeah, that's part of what op OpenJDK is for. It's, it's not just okay. about people working on the code, but if you're using the code and you have a question that's not quite a bug report, as you seem to do, um, yeah, ask it on NetDev, and uh, hopefully somebody will answer it. All right, thanks. And, and sometimes sure. these questions get bounced around a bit where you think you yeah. might think it's a core libraries question. So you'll ask on core libs dev and someone will say, yeah, this isn't really the right place to ask. Uh, you should ask on that list over there. Yeah. And but that's okay. Don't be offended. Yeah. Just, sometimes yeah. that happens more than once even, but it's okay. And you'll eventually get to the right place. Wait, wait when there's a cycle, that is a problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would never happen. Yeah. No. <laughs> also, don't be offended. Don't be offended if, if sometimes mails are ignored, because these are development lists. People are actually trying to get work done. And if there's, if there's people showing up with random questions, how do I use this and that, some, sometimes people don't have time to reply to those. But your question sounds interesting, yeah, it so I, interesting. I would actually yes. like to know the answer. Everyone hopes someone else will answer the question. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you don't get an answer, we'll ask it again in three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so n another question on Twitter. I guess I, I, I'm, I'm just cursed with this question third time today. Um, why, why is there no version support in the model system? <laughs> Do you really want to know? So here, here's a little story. I've gotten better and better at telling this little story. Uh, in early Jigsaw prototypes, and this is like, what, six years ago, it did have versions. In a module declaration, you could say, you know, requires jackson.databind at you know, greater than 2.1 and less than 5.10 and, and whatever, and it, it, it it was there, and it was complicated, and we had had an implementation of it. The initial implementation was pretty um, was pretty simple-minded. Uh, we were on the verge of checking in a very sophisticated piece of cold code called a SAT solver. Who knows what a SAT solver is? It's a big pile of heuristics for solving the Boolean satisfiability problem. Um, if if you have a bunch of modules and you're trying to do resolution into a module graph. Um, there is no optimal solution that, isn't, that is not in the NP-hard category, right? So since you don't want to take forever to do that, you need heuristics to do it quickly. So we were on, on the verge of integrating this, and then and fortunately, you know, just <laughs> before doing this, we thought, wait a minute, we, at that, around that same time, we were starting to think about, well, how is this module system going to interact with the build systems that everybody already uses and will presumably continue to use? Uh, and and you know, thinking about this, well, hmm, it would be bad for adoption if to use the module system you had to scrap the build systems. The, you know, that's like, no, that, that's a non-starter. So we've got to work with the existing build systems. Hmm, okay, well, every build system has its own way, or in some cases, multiple ways of doing version selection. Which way of version selection are we going to do in the module system? Huh, okay, well, we could do this near optimal thing with the SAT solver which none of the existing build systems do. Maybe one of them ought to, but that's a different conversation. So, huh, well, what if we just don't do version selection? Brilliant insight. Let's instead, okay, we, there are already systems around. They're not optimal, you know, they have their fans, they have the, their detractors, but it's what everybody, you know, everybody uses, Maven or Gradle or something that interoperates with that ecosystem. And these build tools provide ways to intermediate and deal with version conflicts and all that other messy stuff in reality. Let's put the module system on a, on a somewhat more abstract plane and say, okay, modules have names. They don't have versions. You can require other module, modules and, you know, by name, and that's it. And if version selection is a big issue, go talk to your build tool. We're not going to solve that problem. It was a massive simplification, um, and it let, it let us remove a lot of hairy code and avoid a lot of carry problems, so in a way it was kind of a little judo move. Um, it, it does surprise a lot of people, uh, but most people, once I tell the little story, they realize, oh, well, maybe that's not so crazy, even if it's counterintuitive on the surface. Okay. So, so Mark, to, to clarify something, so you mentioned that the SAT solver is NP-hard. Yeah. Um, so I think what that means is that potentially it degrades the exponential time. 
And f is that correct? Um, and, and, an NP optimal solution would. Sorry? An optimal an op solution, optimal would, solution yeah. would be exponential and, time. And that's also in the critical path of startup. Yes. So think you, about that a you, little you, while. You really, you really don't want to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So yeah. And, and that's why we were looking at all these heuristics. But even, you know, even the heuristics, well, you know, they can take time. And so, you know, since we don't ha we're not doing version selection, uh, resolution at startup is, is a very simple transitive closure computation. You look at the modules that are obser observable on the module path. You, you, you look them up, you resolve dependencies. It's all extremely simple, extremely fast. Uh, in, you know, in, in, in JDK 9, you know, with a, a lot of effort from Alan and, o and others, we've been able to maintain, maintain, and I think we've even slightly improved startup time. So even, even though we've added this module system that's doing resolution of modules on the module path, you know, Hello World starts up in a teeny bit less time than it did in eight. So that's pretty cool. Yes. Hi, yes. I am uh, one of these programmers that uh, likes to make my uh, variables final um, just because I then think I can't accidentally change them. So for some reason, I don't know it's neurotic or something, but it feels like my code is robuster. Uh, when I check my colleagues, I don't uh, get a lot of support for that because I think I'm just being verbose and why should I make everything final? So I was like, yeah. Uh, you could arguably it's uh, the best practice or not, but I was just wondering, have you ever considered making uh, variables in Java final by default? What would make, uh, of what, what, do, put, what would do that to the uh, JDK? Hmm. I'll tell you what I think, then we'll see what others think. <laughs> if, um, if we had a time machine and we could if go we had back a time 20 machine, years, you know, it, then it, that it, would be a great yeah, idea. Yeah. <laughs> You know, a, l l looking back with 20 years of hindsight, and we've we've done a fair amount of this in the whole module system design, considering well, what should be the defaults for you know should it, you know should things be exported by default, and you, and, you're, and you should ask to encapsulate them, you know things like that. If you if you look back at at access modes and finality, maybe some decisions weren't the best 20 years ago. Uh, having fields and and variables be final by default in retrospect probably would have been a better choice. Uh, having, uh, having, having all kinds of members be private by default, rather than this weird, weird netherworld package private thing, might have been a more sensible choice. Uh, having a public construct, no args constructor inserted for you if you don't write a constructor of your own. Uh, I don't think that was that was a winner. Right. But are we, gonna change, are we going to change any, any of these things at this point? No. We, we, we would break all the code in the world if we did that. I, um, I know. And, tempting though that may be. And, and tempting, and, and, and we could imagine like, you know, uh, you, you thought it took a long time to repurpose underscore. You could imagine a, you know, seven version progression where <laughs> we introduce a mechanism to make things explicitly mutable, and then in the next version, we warn that you know maybe you ought to use that. And you know, over seven versions, we somehow get everyone to change all their code, and they would hate us for it, right? Because uh, most developers who care about this less than they should uh, w would look at this, I think, quite rightly, as why is the compiler ch uh, pestering me to change my code style on a code base that's been working fine for 20 years? Um, and so it, it kind of feels like while that would have been a great choice to make 20 years ago, the, uh, the compatibility cost to the ecosystem of trying to change it now, it really feels like we just missed that boat, and it's, it's sad. Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, I, I think we, we, all, we all share the, the, the kind of the sympathy, you know, sympathy for this, the, the philosophy behind it, but it's just, it's, it's not a thing that's, that's worth changing at this point. Um, you know, given the cost, as kind of a best practice, at least what you know, what what I've come down to doing is declaring every variable in a method final by default. It just gets to be too too much visual noise, so I don't bother because, in general, I, I haven't found that that saves me from from doing stupid stuff too often. But declaring methods final by default and declaring classes, sorry, declaring methods explicitly final, and actually declaring classes. Ex explicitly final is something I, I pretty much do out of habit. Okay, you know. thank you. So I have actually a, comment, a couple comments on that. I think I'm just kind of brainstorming here, but one, one thing for local variables that might be useful is to have a, 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 a 
a static analyzer that enforces single assignment or something like that. Oh yeah, there, there are lot, yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. tools that will okay. layer on top of the right. platform and, so, and help yeah, you so do this. So that's, this that's a to. possibility. And another one is that with value type stuff and maybe the data classes stuff, the fields will be final by default. So we're sort of introducing that in new constructs. Yeah, there have been a number of gentle pushes towards immutability as new language features have been added, uh, as we have the opportunity when we don't have a base of existing code to not be compatible with. But even in that context, you know, someone suggested uh, during Lambda that Lambda parameters uh, should, be, uh, you know, should be final by default. And we considered it for a while because we liked the idea, and then we concluded that you know, the cognitive friction of having two similar constructs that have different default behaviors that arguably should be freely refractable back and forth between each other seemed like it wasn't worth the benefit. So we thought yeah. about it, and we thought about it for quite a while, and then made the right choice. We hope. Yeah. Hello. I have a question about the Java model. In uh, Java 9, the variable handles feature will be introduced, and uh, the memory barriers uh, is a part of it. But the current version of a Java memory model uh, cannot describe uh, this behavior. And uh, is there any plans uh, uh, to update Java memory model? And uh, is it possible to see any draft uh, to understand the evolution way? So Doug Lee um, and a number of others undertook um, an attempt to, re you know, to revamp the Java memory model uh, with the explicit goal of um, aligning the Java memory model with the C++ memory model so that um, you know, uh, when, when you're interoperating between Java code and native code, there's a common set of terminology you can use to reason about, uh, about visibility of rights. Uh, and uh, there's a mailing list on OpenJDK JMM dev uh, with uh, quite a lot of discussion and a somewhat disappointing conclusion, which is that you know, with like 20 of the best theorists in the world working on the problem, there were still unsolved, um, you know, unsolved aspects that they were not comfortable recommending a, a, new, a new set of semantics you know, at the time. So they're continuing to work on it. They were hoping to deliver it into nine. Uh, the the um, the exploration kind of fizzled out, uh, but people are still kind of working on it in the background, and it may come back. But you can see all of the discussion on JMM Dev. Thank you. I have another question um, about stereotypes. They are in Java E, and they are not in Java SE, um, and I miss them because they only work in one context, and I would like to have every annotation um, stereotypable, so to speak. I'm going to plead ignorance e here. Yeah, I so know that there's a concept it, of stereotypes. It's in like a e macro e expansion where you can say this annotation is a macro for this bunch of other things. Um, ah. So, so the, the problem with annotations <laughs> is th they promise like way more than they actually deliver. Angle brackets rant. Yeah, um, and you know we have in the past, you know, extended the annotation facility n multiple times at the request of um, you know folks who were building annotation-heavy frameworks, you know, like like you describe, and each time the result was more complexity and a fairly disappointing increase in expressive power. And the fundamental problem is that there's no type system behind annotations, and yet we want to attach them to things that have types, the things that have inheritance, the things that may have multiple inheritance, and the, uh, the rules surrounding how do you process these things are incredibly ad hoc. If you read the CDI specification, you know, they, they make some fairly untenable ad hoc decisions because they didn't want to deal with the hard cases. And we don't want to bake something so half-baked into the language. So we would much rather say, here's an annotation mechanism that the language has. If you would like to layer additional semantics onto the annotations, be our guest, but it's not going to be part of the language semantics. Too bad. <laughs> it is too bad. Twitter that's, question. That's why, why, why not start with a clean slate and create a new language in parallel? Uh, <laughs> sure, who's going to pay my salary? 
I mean, people do I, that I, every day. I, 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 yeah, there's a new language coming I, out every I used week. to be in academia, and you know, the pay's not that great. Yeah. Hi. Uh, there are several concurrency models, and uh, uh, GDK uh, offers one implementation based on threads. Do you think that uh, GDK will get at some point another concurrency model implementation like we have with the ser from third party libraries in order to help fellow developers to write more deterministic code and uh, not reason about our non determinism with the help of chapter 17 and JSR 133 or not? And the second part of the question, Brian, will be there Java concurrency in practice second edition? We were talking about that earlier. So I think the answer is maybe to both of those questions. Uh, we're not averse to having, say, maybe you're thinking about coroutines and continuations. Um, you know, uh, uh, coroutines are very popular in, in other languages. You know, Go has built-in coroutines and, uh, and channels and people like that. Uh, fits nicely into reactive models. It's possible that might, you, you might see that in the future, but there are an awful lot of problems that have to be solved before we could, with a straight face, uh, add, add that as a facility to, um, you know, uh, you know, to the JRE. It's not just a matter of um, a little bit of language sugar that you know, if, you, if you want things to be non-blocking, they have to be non-blocking all the way down through the libraries, and that's a major effort. So we would, you know, we would like to get there where thinking about such things, but thinking about them in the very, very far off kind of time frame. So maybe. And on the book, maybe. Uh, you know, write, writing a book is a very time-consuming activity. Revising a book is an even more time-consuming activity relative to the amount of new material that's added. And I haven't found the time. Okay. I, Thanks. But I might. Yeah, I, I, another point I'd, I'd, I'd make about the, the concurrency thing is um, when, when we think about what's appropriate to put into Java SC and the JDK, uh, a, a lot of that is colored by, well, what, what are things that we can do in this foundation of the whole ecosystem that can only be done here, right? There, there, are, lot, there are lots of interesting models for, for concurrent programming that can be well supported by a library that's built on top of Java SE and doesn't need anything special and important. And that's great, you know, let, let a thousand flower, flowers bloom and if you find a library out there that, that, that does it for you, perfect, keep using it. Um, but that something like coroutines is, you know, would, would be a deep, deep change. Uh, it, does, it does seem worth doing, but it, it is gonna be a big project. So yeah, we, we, we'd like to do it and it's something that can only really effectively be done uh, inside the platform itself. Um, you've already mentioned several times today, uh, we can't do this because earlier choices, uh, maybe choices we would make differently if we could make them now. Um, do you think a construct could be introduced to the language that would allow us to go back to those choices? Let's say a source version statement or anything that would achieve the same goal? Um, so, so in, in certain ways, we already have that. It's just not in source files. It's how you invoke the compiler. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't really apply to... You can't have two files of different sources in the same project. Well, that not, not, not in the same invocation of the compiler. That's true. Yeah. But so, so, we, so, so here's the thing. The, the investment of... Of, of people's you know, time and, and money in the overall ecosystem, the reason Java has been so successful is as, as, as a developer or as a company investing in a project, you can, you can invest in, in learning the platform, learning how to use it, you know, writing a bunch of code, having, you know, having, a, ha having products that run well in production and so forth. And there's an assurance that things are not gonna change <coughs> radically. Um, the, that that key value of the ecosystem would, you know, be far diminished if we. I, I think if we, if we suddenly said, okay, well, there's there's Java, you know, Alpha, and now we've got Java Beta. That's a different language. It looks kind of like Java, but it's this other thing. 
um, and you have to put a funny token at the top of your source file and it's not gonna be totally compatible and well, why don't we just call that Scala or something? I mean, it's, it, would be a it would be a different language. It would be related to the platform but be a different language. You know, will pe you know, do people wanna put you know, the same level of investment that's gone into you know, Java itself for 20 years in that? Well, maybe, uh, but maybe not. So it's, it, 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 it feels, you know, it, it, it's tempting. You know, it's certainly tempting. It's, it's great sometimes to sit around when you're really frustrated with a, de frustrated with a design problem. It's like, okay, I'm walking into Gosling's office in 1994 and I'm gonna tell him that that's just wrong. But, you know, that's, that's just a fantasy for, for downtime. Um, the reality is, you know, Java has been very successful. Successful. We want to preserve its success, and essentially forking the language seems like running away from the real problem. And, and sort of in addition to the philosophical perspective that Mark offers, there's also an economic perspective, right? So we have certain limited resources for evolving the language, um, and you know, evolving the tools to to go along with that and all that, and we have to assess the return on investment and we want to put our investment where it's gonna have the most impact. Um, and fixing the mistakes of the past is unfortunately more expensive than adding net new features. Um, and so from a return on investment perspective, we're better off uh, investing the effort, you know, adding features like you know, lambdas or pattern matching or what have you, than trying to go back and make Java you know, into what it would have been if we knew then what we knew now. And, and so while it's not out of the question that we might do some of those things, and like the underscore example is an example of where we actually did that in this kind of small way, and people still complain about, about it. Um, but it, it's, it's just not very economically efficient to put our, our resources there. So we'd rather put them where they're gonna make more of a difference for more programmers. Yeah, now in certain areas, and this was actually a question on, on Twitter, in certain areas, um, it is worth having a long-term plan for, uh, for replacing something that was a, a particularly painful mistake in the past. Um, serialization. Serialization, that's exactly what someone <laughs> asked about. Wait, what's, the, what's the plan for corralling the serialization problem? And this is something we have given a lot of thought, thought to over the last few years. Deprecated. Um, we <laughs> indeed, <laughs> uh, it deprecated for removal equals true, please. Doctor, uh, you know, we serialization. I'm I'm sorry. I you know I I I have the greatest respect for the people who who designed it, but it was just wrong. Um, there it is. I said it, and I'm glad. Uh, you know, it, it's just flawed in 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 so many ways. So you know, we we have some ideas about how to how to evolve in the long term towards having a much safer mode of serialization. Some of it, uh, you know, may, may, be, may wind up being supported by uh, some ideas that Brian and others have been working on uh, for, for, you know, supporting language changes, you know, and just get away from this business of, of poking into, you know, random private fields and assuming that there's going to be some compatibility when you stick that in a byte stream and deserialize it five years later on a different platform. Um, and never mind the security issues. So, you know, that, that is a mistake of the past that we think is worth fixing. We, and, and is worth investing in fixing. Uh, making local variables final by default, mm. not so much. Well, thanks for the explanation. Um, for the record, I'm not saying turn Java into Scala using this, please don't. <laughs> that, that's uh, not how I interpret it. I was, I was just <laughs> giving that as an example. Um, yeah, but still, uh, s some mechanism, to, like the underscore example, to allow you to do it quicker, not deprecate it, warning, error, then introduce the new thing. This takes four versions, which is, what, 10 years? I'm sorry. It's a long game. <laughs> it's a long game. Um, yep. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, the Jeb regarding the var and val says that uh, the identifier var will not made into a keyword, instead it will be a reserved type name. Um, and I was wondering, can you explain what it means, um, and also what it means for uh, programmers that currently have a type with said name? Uh, I know that a lot of uh, 
users of Lombok use Vol already. And um, what we at Lombok do is we key off the import. If it says import Lombok.vol, then we replace it. Couldn't you have a type uh, in the Java namespace Vol or Var instead of making it a reserved type name? Whoa. <laughs> Oh, okay, so 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 let, let me. There's there's actually three questions in there. Yeah. So, all right. So so the, so the first question is why why isn't it a keyword, right? And the, and that's a pretty obvious answer. How many people can imagine programs in the world that have very uh, have identifier names of var or val? How many people have this in your own code? Yeah, everybody. Um, so if we made it a keyword, we would break those programs immediately. So that would be dumb. We don't want to do that. Uh, the, uh, but the choice to make it a reserved type name sort of illustrates the, um, that we don't view these compatibility issues as absolute black and white. We assess how much code would, we be, bro would be broken and how deserving of breaking is that code. Um, and so, for example, a type name val, as exists in Project Lombok, does not conform to the, type, uh, to, to the um, identifier naming conventions. It's a, a type name that starts with a lowercase letter. So uh, are we more willing to break code that does that? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, we're, not, we're not willing to do the wrong thing just because it would break Lombok. Uh, it, it, so the thing is you wouldn't break Lombok because we don't care. We would be glad you, if you added it right, because we made sure it's already compatible with the spec. So uh, we would be happy if you would add it. I was just wondering, like, couldn't you use uh, a different way to do this instead of uh, making it a reserved type so, name. So, so in, in the particular case of Lombok, wouldn't it mean the same thing? Yeah, yeah. exactly. You could just uh, get rid of the import and everything would work fine. Yeah. So, so I don't have so a problem, yeah, but no I was problem. just wondering like... Y yeah, you know, it... it um, the, the, the reserved type name thing is a clever hack. It is, it's, a it's a clever hack, and, th and that's a good way to describe it. Um, because if we had it as an explicit type, it would still be a magic type. And that would have more, I think, more linguistic complexity than, have, than, than simply admitting this is reserved as a type name. And yes, if you have types that have this name, well, they should have capitalized the V, I'm sorry. And, uh, but, it, but, but as Mark says, it, it is a clever hack. Yeah. Okay. And, Thank you know, clever hacks are good. Sometimes. Um, question for Dr. Deprecator, maybe, from Twitter. Let's see. Uh, where'd it go? Do, 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 do. Oh, I thought you had it. <laughs> well, I had it. It slipped oh. away. Uh, Java 8 replaced the standard date API. Are there plans to replace any other default library APIs in future versions? Oh, is it that one? Um, let's see, are there plans to replace other default APIs? Um, well, or maybe just remove some that we already have. Oh, it's probably the batteries are pro probably low, and that's why ah. we're not making that terrible noise. I see. So you have to start the handheld mic to, uh, to the next guy. Oh, yeah. oh, Brian's mic was oh, making the noise. Is, is, oh, is, is my, my, my mic is the problem? Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. Then I stop. Okay, I won't answer your Brian's questions. Okay, Brian, Brian's not answering yeah. any more yeah. questions. Sorry. I guess so. <laughs> so. So offhand, I'm not aware of any, any core APIs that we're intending on, on replacing. I think we're, we're, dealing with, we're, we're dealing with getting rid of the, 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 the obsolete core APIs already, and that's hard enough. So for instance, um, those of you who have been looking at uh, Java for a long time remember the original pre-collections collections like Vector and Hashtable or Hashtable. And um, uh, those aren't even deprecated yet. And I have a, a, you know, there's a plan to deprecate them, but there's a lot of code out there that still uses them. And so deprecating something um, imposes a cost. Um, we might not, we probably will not actually remove them, but even if you add deprecations, then that introduces warnings, and some people are very sensitive about warnings in their, their code base. Um, so as with, they should be. Yeah, um, as, as we are, as a matter of fact. So one of the things is that if we were to deprecate something, it, it actually creates a lot of warnings in the JDK build itself, and we try to keep our warnings clean. 
And so, uh, so it's sort of creating work for ourselves to deprecate something. Um, with the java.time stuff, okay, so you could say conceptually, sure, the java.time stuff is new. There are a lot of good things about it. It's a conceptual replacement for um, job util date and uh, calendar. Great, get rid of that old stuff. Well, if you look at the amount of stuff out there that uses those, um, there would be like tens of thousands of warnings generated by, by deprecating those. I, 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 well, so, and removing them would just break tons and yeah, tons. Yeah, so, so they're not, they're not going to be removed. They probably will be deprecated at some point, but um, it's like surgery. <laughs> um, <laughs> hmm? Well, okay, yeah, so, so I think the, the, if my belief is that the main issue with deprecating things is generation of warnings and how, uh, what mechanisms are available for, for people who are concerned about warnings to deal with them. And I think we do need to work on that more. That is something that, that we've thought about, but we don't have anything going on in nine. And that's actually, I think, limiting the rate at which we can deprecate things. And here's another consideration about um, you know the, uh, introducing the the new datetime API. So uh, we had the old date API, and then we have the new datetime API. And yes, the new one is better, and yes, it makes sense to consider deprecating the old one in favor of the new one. The problem is there are interfaces in which date appears as a type. So you might have an interface like you know that has a method get last access date, and it returns a date, right? So now. Uh, there may be subclasses of, of that interface out there in the wild that we can't control. So uh, deprecating that, uh, deprecating the date class, uh, ripples into interfaces that use the date class. Um, and you know, sometimes these, the, you know, these tendrils can go fairly deep. And so uh, deprecation is not simply a matter of don't use this, because there might be APIs that already use this, and you may not be able to control all their uses. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, you made it very clear that uh, backwards compatibility uh, for Java is very important and that you're not just going to break it, uh, especially not since the cost is not enough. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, are you feeling or are you waking up at night like, oh, uh, Java 13, we can't do anything that will not break someone's code. We have to make a change that will break the backwards compatibility. Do you think that's coming? or? Are you just like, meh, we'll handle it in the, uh, on any future? Well, I, I, I think we, we've, you know, th th this is a, it is a burden one, one chooses to take on when, when taking a job, <laughs> you know, a job working on, on the JDK, whether you're, you're at Oracle or elsewhere. Um, I, I think a part of this goes to sort of, I, I guess, a deep philosophical question about the, about the life cycle of a language on a platform. You know, at some point, you know, Java may, 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 may reach, reach a stage where you just can't change it much anymore. Um, it's actually had, for, for a language on a platform, a really good run compared to a lot of others. You know, when will Java reach that point? I don't know. I, it, will, it won't be next year. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's got at least another, another 10 years in it, maybe 20, who knows. But you know, at some point, it will be time to move on, and, 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 and that'll be OK. Um, you know, the, and and the, the other thing about, about compatibility is there are just there's so many variants of compatibility. One of the things we've, we've really struggled with with the modularity work is modularizing the platform and encapsulating internals has created you know, problems in practice for lots of people where they come, they come running at us with pitchforks saying, you're not compatible, you broke my application. Yeah. And the reason we broke their application isn't because we removed, a de you know, an obscure deprecated method that nobody uses, you know, that was part of the, uh, the Java SE API for many years. The reason we broke their application was because their application uses a library that depends on a jar file that depends on another jar file that hasn't been updated since 2002 and reaches into the numeric wrapper classes in the Java Lang package and expects a certain private static field to exist in each one of them. Yeah, yeah, but uh, and, ge and guess what? You can't do that with yeah. JDK9. So you know that 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 you know that part part of the. 
the what we think will be the long-term benefit for the for the ecosystem of, of the pain of moving to nine. We know that pain, that nine is going to be a harder release to move to because of problems like that, which do come under the guise of oh, compatibility. You broke compatibility. Um, part of the long-term benefit is we are reducing the practical compatibility surface area. You know, after nine, you you won't be able to write code unless you're doing really nasty things that depends on JDK internals, and that will give us freedom to change those internals in ways that for about 15 years we've felt very conservative about changing. So some of the things that we, are, we, are, that we do, they, they may seem like they cause pain, but they're actually in service of enabling further evolution in a, in a compatible way going forward, similar to the way that we've, we've evolved the platform in the past. By the way, just to get a flavor for the type of things that Mark is talking about, is we did a talk yesterday on, 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 on JDK9 where we went through all of the different compatibility issues. Um, and it's, as Mark said, it's not always removing supported APIs. It's all these other implementation changes that tend to break things. So we went through a bunch of uh, examples yesterday. It's all actually all recorded and uh, from DevOps University session yesterday, if you want to check it out. Yeah, I will. Thanks. That was kind of a philosophical answer. I hope it was illuminating. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll just add two quick points to that. Uh, one is, yes, it's really hard. That's why language evolution takes so long, because you know, having the idea of, wouldn't it be great if I could write this code? Well, that's you know, the first five minutes. And the next three years of work is, how do you work it into the existing model so it doesn't look like it was nailed on, so it doesn't break existing code, uh, et, et cetera? And that's where all the work is. And so uh, the flip side, uh, you know, the flip side of that is, yes, it can be done. We can deal with it. We're professionals, but it does mean things take longer. Another way that we keep from reaching that point that Mark described, where we've crammed so many features into the language that there's no place left to cram the language a new one, and, the, and the libraries, and the, the and the libraries, is don't cram so much in. Right? We're fairly conservative about the features we add because we know that each feature we add adds some bad weight. It gets us closer to that point where uh, we really are going to regret some, some interaction of decisions. Uh, so uh, the, the antidote for, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, for, for incompatibility is take your time. And, and that's what we yep. do. All right. Two minutes left. Does anybody have a quick question? Does anybody have a quick question with a guaranteed, yeah, yeah, guaranteed quick yeah, answer? A quick one. Uh, will you add severity to the uh, deprecation? Severity to deprecation. Yeah, so you can have some that you say, well, uh, these are not major things, like linked list, we will leave them, but you should preferably not use them. And you have other ones that say, well, these are really bad, you should never use them. And then in the flags you can say, well, crash, or uh, fill the builds whenever a certain severity is reached. In fact, right. we, we have done that very thing in nine, at least the first yeah. step. Okay. Right, so, so there's, a, there's a new attribute for removal, which is simply a Boolean, which is, which is sort of a severity. But in fact, actually pinning down the semantics of even adding one level of severity it was difficult. How enough. many hours went into the discussion <laughs> of for removal? Quite, quite a few. It started out as an enum with this whole variety of different yeah. Reason codes. Right. Um, I think those are the, the, the whole different reason codes um, is interesting to think about. Um, it was an interesting discussion, but but uh, specifying that in an API and using it in practice turned out to be too difficult. Uh, so I think I can imagine somebody saying, "Oh, I want an int or I want a double value as a severity." I, you know, I think what that, does it even mean? Yeah, what would it mean? Like so, so I'm going to set my severity level for issuing errors instead of warnings at 5.37. Um, there is actually a third level of deprecation, which is to have no warning whatsoever, but a note in the Java doc that says you should use that other thing instead. So that's sort of an informal lowest level. And we do do that in some cases. Time is up, the sign says. Thank you very much.